Well, hey, everyone. Welcome to Community Church. My name is Dan. I'm one of the pastors here. And my name is John. I'm also one of the pastors here. And we are so glad that you've decided to join us today. We have an awesome service plan for you. I know you're going to absolutely love it. What are, you, what are you looking at, Dan? What's happening, man? Like, what, what is this here? You look like a judge on night court What are you talking about? This is just what I wear all the time. I wear this around the office. Really? You know that. No, there's got to be a reason why you're wearing that. There is a reason, Dan, and that's mm-hmm. because today is graduation Sunday. It's the day that we Woo! celebrate our graduates. We have so many graduates. We have a ton in Greensburg, right? Yeah, yeah. We've got some from college and then uh, some from high school as well. And then I know you've got some here in Batesville, too. We do. I even got two at home. And we are so proud of our seniors. We are so excited for you. Hey, we know, seniors, this was not how you envisioned your last couple months of school going, maybe even your graduation ceremony. And while you may be disappointed with that, we are so proud and happy for you. In fact, we want to have a little impromptu celebration with you. So Dan's going to lead that. Yeah, yeah. Everybody gather around. All right, gather around your senior, whoever that is. And we're going to just yell across the ether, uh, congratulations on three. Ready? One, two, three. Congratulations. Congratulations. Congratulations, seniors. So proud of you. Yeah, absolutely. Super big deal. Uh, So one of the things that we have realized over the past few weeks as we've been doing this online is that there are some people that are watching that are not necessarily connected in a community group. And so if that's you and you want to be part of a community group, but there's really no way to do that physically right now, then uh, we just want to encourage you because we have an online community group that meets on Monday nights for anybody that is not connected in a group. And if you want to participate in that, all you got to do is to RSVP is to go to icommunitychurch.com. That's our website. uh, And you can go there to uh, RSVP for that. Hey, uh, so when we shoot this, when we record this, um, some things happen that we can't control, and we just had something awesome that we couldn't control happen. We had a bunch of folks actually show up mid-recording We while we were trying to do this earlier um, to say that they missed us and to encourage us for the service. It was awesome, wasn't it, Dan? Yeah, it was amazing. These folks just, I mean, a uh, bunch of them from Greensburg and then some here from Baseville as well, but they just wanted to uh, come by and tell us that they missed us and and thank us for what we've been doing here online. And it was so good to see him. It was so hard not to go over there and give them all a hug. It was so encouraging. Thank you guys. Thank you for coming out. We appreciate that. Yep. So the uh, other thing that we want to talk about today is um, is sort of in line with the seniors. Every week we've been doing a community spotlight where we just choose someone uh, in the community at either in Batesville or in Greensburg who has uh, is really kind of on the front line of this whole coronavirus thing and had a discussion with them. Uh, and so this week, we're actually talking to Sonia Kochmeyer, uh, who is the assistant principal, one of the assistant principals at Greensburg High. So we're going to cut and watch that video right now. Hi, I'm Sonia Kochmeyer. Um, I am married to my one and only uh, JD Kochmeyer. And this is Joel. And James is sleeping and we have a great pup named Barkley don't we normally I am at Greensburg Community High School I serve as their assistant principal and we miss everybody so much (laughs) so what what do you think have been the biggest challenges for you during this time (laughs) not counting him Um, keeping up with two little ones for sure Uh, but really uh, honestly the biggest um, challenge has been uh, just knowing the emotional and spiritual strain that this has been on uh, my family, um, my colleagues, um, our students and staff, um, and really just our, you know, our community and, and state too. I mean, part of my job has morphed into f- calling home, and I talk to all these families for a variety of reasons. And the number of our kids that have come in contact with it, um, we have an incredible CNA program. We have a lot of kids at work in the nursing homes and just uh, that's one thing that I wrote down my like my biggest challenge is just concern for like their mental health. If there was something we could be praying for you uh, and the staff at Greensburg High and just the school system in, in general, um, what would that be? What, how can we pray for you guys? Um, that's a really great question. Um, I think it really comes down to what Seth shared this this week 
um, this weekend on Sunday, um, and just uh, the Philippians 4, 5 verse, and let your gentleness be evident to all. Um, we don't know what each person has gone through in these last eight weeks, um, or however long this lasts, and just um, although some of us uh, may be riding um, high on curtails and have enjoyed this time, um, other people have faced some of the, the worst times of their life, and um, just to be kind and gentle to each person um, because their circumstances are different and we just don't, you just might not know what those are. Absolutely. Yeah, you're absolutely right. Thank you for sharing that, Sonia. And I just really wanted to thank the church leadership for um, providing such an incredible experience um, each Sunday, uh, even though we cannot be there physically together. Um, from the message to worship, um, to the great jokes be beforehand. Um, it's just so nice to be able to uh, feel like we're still there. On behalf of Community Church, on behalf of your community, thank you for caring about the education of the next generation. Thank you for the way you're loving people and thank you for sharing with us today. Thank you, Dan. Thanks so much. Yeah, that was great, wasn't it? And you that can just great. tell her uh, and all our educators, their little teacher hearts are just broken right now and hurting. And so we are so proud of the job that you've done. Like us, you've had to really switch the way you do everything in this time. Uh, and it's meant a lot to us the way that you've continued to do that. Uh, another thing that we want to mention real briefly is that a bunch of the folks from Greensburg actually got together uh, some gift bags. Mm. It all started with, and here's a picture of them, all started with us talking about the uh, cleaning staff at the hospital and how their, their job just has to be like way harder than it was. And it eventually expanded to all su support staff at Decatur County Memorial Hospital. And so uh, these ladies got together, a lot of people donated and uh, they put together these gift, ba gift bags and we delivered those to the hospital last week. And it's uh, just a really important thing that we um, look for those opportunities that during this time we have our eyes open for opportunities to bless our community. And I'm so proud of our folks for doing that. Yeah, that is so awesome. In fact, your generosity as a church, especially through this time, has been mind blowing with just everything we've been able to do and give back to our community. And thank you so much for those of you that uh, generously support our church each week through your giving. Uh, we know that some of you are going through some financial hard times, but we appreciate every gift that is given. In fact, if, if you're not sure how to give, you can always just text CC Give to 97000. But thank you so much for giving so we can continue to give back to our communities and do what we do here on our recordings. Yep. So in just a moment, the uh, band is going to lead us in some worship. And so why don't we just take a second right now and just pray for our service today. Uh, Father, we are so grateful for the people of God. And during this time, especially God, it's so important that we live out our faith in a very open way. And so for those who give regularly, for those who have gone the extra mile during this time, God, I am so grateful for that. Thank you for the way that you are strengthening the church because we all know that, um, uh, that some of the hard times are still yet to come. And so God, your, your church is the plan. Um, we are meant to be your hands and feet on this planet during this time. So thank you for that. God, we ask that uh, as we sing these songs to you and to no one else, uh, as we um, listen to your word and it changes us from the inside out, God, that this would all be about you, uh, not about us, that no matter where we are and um, uh, no matter what the situation is at home and what's going on, that we would point our attention toward who you are during this time. God, we're so grateful for who you are and that you're bigger than any circumstance that we find ourselves in. Uh, be with us during this time. It's in Christ's name we pray. Amen. All right, good to see you guys again virtually. I'm just believing that I can see you. We're really, uh, we're really blessed to be here every week at this recording. It's been really nice to uh, to still worship together, and I hope that uh, you guys love it as much as we do. And so, if you want to go ahead and stand wherever you are, just get comfortable, just get relaxed. We're gonna sing 
sing some worship music, all right? Here we go. Sing There is Healing. There is healing in the power of the Lord Most High. There is courage in the shadow of His wings. There is peace unending over all my life. There is freedom that washes over me. I'm 
it is our pleasure to pour out our praise to you. We just ask that that would just be the heart cry of us all, all week, just to pour out our praise to you. You're so worthy. It's in your name we pray. Well, hey, everybody, thank you so much for tuning in with us today, whether it's in the morning or in the evening, as you're at home or as you're out jogging, however it is that you're connecting with us. We're so glad you can be a part of our church family today. My name is Seth, and I would love the opportunity to meet you at some point in time if we haven't met yet, whenever it is that our doors are able to be opened again. Now, as we begin our time together today, we're going to do something a little bit different, and I want to teach you a verse, and I want to invite you to memorize it. I know we don't talk a ton about memorizing, but it's a great habit to get into, and this is a great verse that goes along, especially as we bring our series Anchored in the Storm to a close. It comes from Psalm verse thir- or chapter 33, verse 22, and it, it reads, May your unfailing love be with us, Lord, even as we put our hope in you. May your unfailing love be with us, Lord, even as we put our hope in you. Now, wherever you are, whether it's at home or out running or in the car or whatever, I want you to just say it with me, even if people look at you like you're crazy because you got earbuds in and you're talking to yourself. But just go ahead and say it with me on the count of three. We're going to read it together. Ready? One, two, three. May your unfailing love be with us, Lord, even as we put our hope in you. Say it with me again. May your unfailing love be with us, Lord, even as we put our hope in you. And now we're going to take it down from the screen. We're going to see how you did here. May your unfailing love be with us, Lord, even as we put our hope in you. I want to encourage you. We're going to have... Uh, phone backgrounds uh, shared across social media. Make sure you grab one of those, put it on your phone or share it on your Facebook uh, page. We'd love for you to begin sharing that message around. May your unfailing love be with us, Lord, even as we put our hope in you. Now, as we begin our time together today, I've had a couple of experiences over the last couple of months, really, that have kind of come into focus for me. Uh, the first one was a dear friend of ours from our Greensburg campus, Barb Weber. Barb, you may be watching today, and I just want to say hi to you, but Barb was diagnosed uh, back in March with inoperable terminal cancer, and uh, if you know Barb, she is one of the most amazing women of faith who is just an absolute reflection of God's love. And... Uh, what a beautiful person she is and what a joy it's been to know her and to see her walk through this season of life. But then on Friday night, I got news that a friend of mine from college, uh, his dad was also diagnosed recently with terminal cancer. And my friend's dad, it's possible you've heard of him before because he's traveled around the country and across the world. Um, He has a not-for-profit organization. Um, His name is Ravi Zacharias. Ravi Zacharias is a Christian apologist. That doesn't mean he apologizes. That means he has conversations with atheists and he debates the merits of atheism versus Christianity. And frankly, he's really good at it. It's possible you've read his books or heard his radio program or seen uh, clips of him on YouTube. Ravi is just a remarkable man. Uh, his, fr- his son, Nate, and I were good friends in college, such that I got the opportunity to stay at their house and meet Ravi personally. He spoke at our commencement uh, at Taylor the year that I graduated. And um, honestly, my heart just broke as I heard the news of his diagnosis. And uh, as I looked at what their ministry posted on their website, I just got to thinking to myself, you know, this is where faith becomes sight. This is when all of the things we've lived for, that we have proclaimed, that we have upheld with our lives, it kind of all comes to fruition in these moments. And to see the way he, the way Barb are managing this season of their lives is um, just really remarkable. 
And then I juxtaposed that with another experience that I had on Saturday when I went to the store. And when I came back to my car, there was a car next to mine that had parked there that had one of these emblems on the back that you perhaps have seen before. It has a fish with legs on it, kind of like the Christian fish, but this one had legs on it. And inside it said, atheist. And the gentleman in the car was putting his mask on, getting ready to get out and go out into public. And I just began thinking to myself, how does an atheist manage a storm like this? Because on the one hand, I realize that there is, are two different approaches to life. There's the approach of hope and hopefulness that I've seen out of Barb, that I've seen out of, of Ravi, that, that I've seen out of others that I've known. And then there's a general sense of hopelessness. And I, and I don't know this gentleman personally, but it's just my perceived, uh, I mean, I don't know how an atheist survives a storm like a pandemic. In fact, the question that I kind of began wrestling with is this, how does one who believes all there is to life is this life hold on to any amount of hope or joy when this life seems hopeless? What do atheists do when storms come? And it can be any storm. It's not just a pandemic, whether it's a divorce or a diagnosis or the loss of a loved one, whether it's a son or a daughter running away or not being able to get a date or not being able to have children or you know, not getting into the school you want to get into, not, getting able, not being able to have a graduation or say goodbye to friends. I mean, whatever the storm is, whatever the storm is, how can one ever know peace when the world is so completely random and, and there's no sense to the randomness. See, we could say this, if, if not God, what can you anchor your life to that will sustain you even when life doesn't make sense? And I sure hope you spend some time thinking about that. In fact, as we bring this series anchored in the storm to a close, that's what we've been talking about. If you've missed any of these, I want to invite you to go to our website, iCommunityChurch.com, or to our YouTube channel, videos.iCommunityChurch.com, and catch up on all that we've been talking about. Because we've been saying over and over and over again that Scripture really gives us an anchor. It gives us an answer to what to place our anchor in. Even still, though, there's a question that I think kind of has been begged throughout this whole series, and my hope is to begin answering that today and hopefully kind of give you a bit of an answer, and that is the question of why are there storms in the first place? Why are there storms in the first place? Storms that give atheists a reason for not believing. Storms that you look at, the, you know, evil. Why, is there, why do bad things happen in the world? How can a good God how can a good God allow storms in the world? It's possible for you, your faith was shipwrecked because of a storm that you went through. And again, I mean, we see storms every day. Uh, the, they're so prolific, especially with the advent of technology. We see hurricanes and tornadoes. We see islands that are ravaged by, by hurricanes. We see earthquakes, I mean, all over the news, all over media. We see storms, we see pandemics, we see dictators. I mean, whatever the storm is, and the thing about storms is, on the one hand, we talked last week about how they can kind of be beautiful, but they're often so very destructive. And so we ask the question, why is there so much pain and suffering? Why is there so much pain and suffering in the world? How can I anchor myself to a God who allows a world to be ravaged by storms? How can I maintain hope in God in a storm-filled world? That is a very real question. And my guess is if you have faced a storm before, which is all of us who are engaging with this today, if you've faced a storm before, you have undoubtedly asked yourself the question. But if you have unnecessarily given up your faith because of your conclusion to the answer to that question, I hope you will pay attention today. I hope you will lean in because today I want to give some context to that and I want to give an answer that I hope will be hopeful to you. Now, in order to answer that, we need to talk about what hope is. Hope is really a future-oriented thing. It's not something that we currently have. Hope is something that we kind of lean our lives into. Let, let me give you a definition. Hope is a person or a thing in which your expectations for life are centered. It's a person or a thing. We could say hopelessness is the feeling that that person or that thing won't come through or they can't come through, and that's when we feel hopelessness. And hope is something that you kind of uh, 
By default, I mean, when you're, when you're born, you have hope in your parents generally or your caregivers that they'll touch you, that they'll, they'll hug you, that they'll snuggle with you, that they'll provide food for you, that they'll change your diapers, that they'll, they'll give you a place to sleep for the first three to six months of your life. I mean, your hope is in, in somebody's ability to provide for you. But over time, our hope begins to shift, doesn't it? Over time, we begin thinking about, you know, the approval of our peers and whether or not, you know, they'll approve of who we are. And so our hope gets placed in that, which is always kind of a moving target because nobody ever fully gets the approval of their peers all the time. Or our hope gets shifted into having a GPA and pursuing a certain career path or walking down a certain direction in life. Or, or our hope begins being in the freedom that comes from a driver's license or having your own car. Or hope moves into a relationship, whether with a boyfriend or a girlfriend. And then as we become adults, I mean, our hopes even continue to move into things like getting married or having a career, having kids, uh, money, uh, our kids being, you know, star athletes. I mean, our hopes move into all sorts of things. Um, and, and so we anchor our lives into something. We anchor our lives into something that we trust will support our dreams and our security and our future. And we don't realize we've done it. It's kind of just this default thing that we do, and we don't realize we do it until the object that we've placed our hope in goes away. Until those things are cut out from underneath us, until a storm comes, and we realize that they didn't actually provide anchor faith. They didn't actually hold us down and protect us and care for us. It's almost like we gasp for hope in those moments, as we do for air when the wind is knocked out of us. And so we wonder, and over time, over time as we grow older, we hope in things that will offer financial security, that will offer emotional security. And it's very possible in the middle of this pandemic, you have found yourself feeling hopeless because it has taught us that the things that we look to for financial security, the things that we've looked to for our emotional security, they can, they can be cut out from underneath us in a matter of moments. In fact, suicide centers will tell you that the leading reasons for suicide come down to an overwhelming sense of hopelessness as it comes to our financial and our emotional well-being. Now, the whole point of the series that we've been talking about is that, that throughout the pages of Scripture, we are taught to anchor ourselves to and to place our hope in God, that He is the only one who can provide us with any sort of anchor faith. That God is our only hope. And honestly, the history of our nation is generally in times of storms, we move in that direction. I was thinking back to 9-11, which was nearly 20 years ago now. I don't know if you can believe that, if you were alive during 9-11. But I'll never forget, I mean, the, the Sunday after 9-11, churches were packed. And people flocked to church because they were looking for answers to the thing in which they were placing their hope. But during this pandemic... We've turned to exercise, many people. We've turned to drugs as marijuana sales have like shot through the roof and alcohol is considered you know, an essential business. As we've turned to entertainment and streaming subscriptions, again, shoot through the roof. Don't you wish you had invested in Netflix or Hulu right before the pandemic took place? And it's almost as though we believe we can entertain ourselves through or exercise through or anesthetize our ways through a storm. But the truth is, Scripture points to those things do not work. And the reason they don't work long term, they may work for a moment, but the reason they don't work long term is that our world is broken. And as we look at the storm patterns that we go through on this planet, we realize that storms really are a way of life. So how? Do we find hope in a world ravaged by storms? How do we find hope in a world ravaged by storms? I think the Apostle Paul gives us a great answer to that question. And he wrote it in a letter that he wrote to Christians who were living in the city of Rome under Nero as the emperor. 
Now, I want to tell you that what we're going to look at today is uh, a little bit complicated. It's extremely confusing. Uh, you may feel like, uh, you know, that, that it's a little bit above your head, and I just want you to know that if you find this complicated, if you find this confusing, it's not you. It's Paul. Paul was trying to explain some incredibly significant things about God and how do you even begin to explain the God of the universe? And so I believe Paul did, you know, the best he could in explaining and I'm probably going to do a worse job and I'm going to just do the best I can in trying to explain what Paul had to say and what, and what he was teaching us about God. But please know this, you know, as, as we go through here, you know, I wish we had time to go through every single verse by verse by verse, and you may be frustrated that I don't go through every single verse. My encouragement to you would be to open up the Bible tonight or tomorrow or throughout the week. Actually, I would encourage you to do it every day of the week. Open it up and read through and parse through on your own and try and read over and over because you're probably going to have to read it over and over and over to really fully understand what it was that Paul was talking about and trying to explain. And that will be a win. Anytime we open the Bible, it's a win. So when Paul begins in Romans chapter 8, he really talks about a tension that we all live with. And it's this tension I'd like to call or Paul calls the law of sin and death, that there's this law that we as human beings are all bound by. It's like the law of gravity. You may not like it, but gravity exists, which means that if you want to step out of a window, you're going to fall to the ground, whether you like it or not. And the same is true with the law of sin and death. It's not something that you chose necessarily. It's something that was chosen for you. It's a law. You can't, you, you can't break it or you'll break yourself against it. And the reason why sin and death came about is because of an event that we Christians call the fall. It's um, when sin entered the world. We believe that it's when Adam and, and Eve ate from the apple in the Garden of Eden. And as a result of that, death resulted. Death came as a result of what Adam and Eve did. There's no way out of it. It applies to all of us. It's a law. And whether you believe Adam and Eve were real people or not, the truth is we can all see, we can all see how death reigns in this life, how, um, how death applies to all of us on this planet. In fact, we've spent a lot of time over the last couple of months talking about that concept. If you missed it, you can go online and check that out, and I'm not going to go into more detail on it now. But it's with that backdrop that Paul speaks. And here's what Paul said in Romans chapter 8, verse 18. He said, I consider, I consider that our present sufferings. That's the present storms that we find ourselves in. Now, Paul, if anyone knew storms, Paul knew storms. I mean, they were a part of his life, particularly throughout his adulthood. Paul knew storms as probably you and I never have known them. Anytime we experience pain, anytime we experience brokenness, Paul says, I consider that our present sufferings are not worth comparing with the glory that will be, that's a future concept that will be revealed in us. That there is a future glory that is coming to us. Now, Paul wasn't saying that storms aren't real. He wasn't pretending that they don't exist. And you know, the coronavirus isn't a reality. He wasn't saying that at all. Paul was saying that storms are a precursor to something better that's coming later. That our current sufferings don't compare to the future glory that's going to be revealed. Now, the question is, you know, why does it have to be in the future? Why do we have to wait? In fact, why is there suffering and storms now? Why doesn't God just, you know, snap his fingers or, you know, do the genie thing or, you know, and make all the storms go away? Why are there storms in the first place? Now, you may not know this, but in Jesus' day, it was believed that storms or, or suffering was a direct consequence to personal behavior. In fact, there's, there's a story in John chapter, chapter 9 where Jesus is walking with his disciples and they see a man who's been blind since birth. And his disciples look at Jesus and they say to him, you know, teacher, who sinned? Who sinned, this man or his parents, that he was born blind? I mean, that was just the general concept of the day, that because of personal sin, there is personal suffering. And Jesus' response is remarkable. He says, no one, neither. Eh, you know, wrong question, wrong answer. Bad, that's a bad question built on some bad assumptions. That, that Jesus never taught the concept of karma. You know the concept of karma. It's the idea that what goes around comes around. 
We get what we deserve. In fact, the whole message of the gospel is the opposite of karma. The whole message of everything that Jesus taught is that you don't deserve life, but I'm going to give it to you anyway. That you are so imperfect that the the wages of sin, the cause of sin is death. But because I love you so much, I am going to die for you and give you life. Now, that's not to say there isn't a sense of sowing and reaping. Because the truth is, our decisions all come with prepackaged consequences. If you make it a general habit to lie to people, the consequences is nobody is going to trust you, right? As, as people begin to realize that you're not a truth-telling person, nobody's going to trust you. And so, so there are definitely personal consequences for personal de- decisions, but that doesn't explain why we have things like pandemics, that doesn't explain why we have things like earthquakes. That doesn't explain why, why there's cancer, why there are things like the Holocaust. That doesn't explain why abuse exists. Some people would say it's God's judgment. I was a server in high school, and I had a table once that I was waiting on, and the gentleman said to me, do you think all the earthquakes, because there were some earthquakes happening in California at the time, he said, do you think all the earthquakes are because of God's judgment on the people out in California? I was like 17 years old. I I didn't know exactly how to answer, but I know what I was thinking in those moments. I was thinking, I hope not, because, you know, God's judgment could come toward me any day, and, and, you know, there should be earthquakes here too. So, so, So the question is, okay, you know, I understand personal consequences from my decisions, but, but what about, what about things like pandemics? What about things like natural disasters? How do you explain the, just death? How do you explain the fact that we all die, that we all have a death date? And so Paul answers the question, here's why. Here's why he says, for the creation was subjected to frustration. That frustration is not always getting what we want. I can relate to frustration. Can you? Have there been any things in your life over the last two months that have been frustrating? Like going to the store and not finding toilet paper or meat, you know, wanting to be virus free, you know, having to homeschool your kids, wanting to get a date and getting turned down or not getting the scholarship you want or wanting to have children, not being able to have children or wanting a promotion or getting a house. I mean, there are so many things in our lives that are disappointing and that are frustrating to us. And the reason is that this earth is condemned to decay. There's decay all over and and death, God has just set it free. He's allowing it to run its course because of the fall, because of the decision that Adam and Eve made to eat from the fruit. Now, what's interesting is God's kind of allowing allowing it to run free and, and yet we try to stop it and we try to slow it down. That's why we dye our hair so people can't guess our age. That's why we get plastic surgeries to get rid of wrinkles. That's why we get Botox injections. And yet Paul says we're still subject to it. We're still all subjected to it. And here's why, he says. It's in hope. We're subjected to it in hope that the creation itself will be, again, this is future, it's a future hope that will be liberated or freed from its bondage to decay. See, God cares so much about the created world. And not just humanity. He cares about the created world, which always kind of blows my mind that sometimes Christians don't care about caring for the environment. I'm not saying worship the environment, but a responsible caring for the environment. God cares about the created world and the brokenness. And and it's because of the fall, death took over. And it's not normal. It's normal because we know it, but we know it shouldn't be. That's why funerals don't make sense to us. That's why we hurt when people we care about die. And everybody is subject to it. 2018, Billy Graham, a remarkable Christian man who probably influenced more people during my lifetime for the kingdom of God than anybody else, he died. 1997, Mother Teresa, another godly woman who influenced so many people and did so much good for the kingdom of God, she died. My grandmother, who was an amazing woman of faith, spent her last 10 years, her last 10 years or so, with her mind ravaged by Alzheimer's disease. Amazing people of faith are still subjected to death. Which explains why people who like to control the world around them are always frustrated because the world doesn't cooperate. And your kids that you try and, you know, have a will for, they have wills of their own and they kind of do their own thing and things break and, and stuff falls apart and it just is never the perfection that we think and feel that it should be. Even Jesus, don't miss this, even Jesus, the son of God, was subject 
to death. So how much more will we be? So Paul says, don't put your hope in things on earth. Don't, don't put your anchor, don't anchor yourself to things on earth. Instead, we long for something to be different. He says, if we find ourselves with a desire that nothing in this world, I'm sorry, C.S. Lewis said that. Let me go back to what C.S. Lewis had to say, not Paul. He said, if we find ourselves with a desire that nothing in this world can satisfy, the most probable explanation is that we were made for another world, that we recognize that something in us is broken, and so something in us knows that there is a longing in us for a different world. Paul described this like a mother giving birth. Now, I've, I've never given birth, but I've heard the pains are terrible. And the reason why women are willing to go through those terrible pains are because their pain is eclipsed by something different. You know what it's eclipsed by? The joy of a birth, the joy of a child, the joy of the good thing that is coming. And so Paul says, for those of us who are Christians, I mean, we have the spirit of God living inside of us, reminding us, reminding us that we have hope. He continues on, he says, for in this hope, for in this hope we were saved, in the hope that life isn't all there is, that this life on this earth isn't all there is. Jesus followers sign on to a future hope, knowing that there is something greater that's coming later. Now, that doesn't mean that it's only going to be storm clouds and death and destruction and doom and sadness here, that there are never any moments for joy. But the point is that there is decay and we lean ourselves into a future hope. Paul goes on, though, he says, but hope that is seen is no hope at all. Who hopes for what they already have, which is a rhetorical question. Nobody hopes for what they already have. If they already have it, they don't need to hope for it. It's, this is an obvious recognition that the world is broken. And so he comes to the conclusion. He says, but if we hope for what we do not yet have, we wait for it patiently. That is, we don't give up even in the storm, even in the midst of unhappy endings. Even in broken relationships, even when the stock market crashes, even when a virus, you know, overtakes the world, even when you don't get the date, even when you struggle to get pregnant, even when he doesn't call you back or she doesn't call you back, even when you don't get to say your goodbyes to your graduating class, even then, he says, we don't give up hope. We wait expectantly because hope was never in something on earth anyway. Because we realize that there is nothing on earth worth putting our hope in. And so he said, we see God at work behind the scenes. We know he's doing things. And our spirit, the, the spirit rather, that's inside of us is even praying for us, giving us strength. And so Paul asked the question and he asked, what then shall we say in response to these things? What do we do in response to these things? What do we do knowing that this world is broken, that we're waiting patiently for this future hope? This conclusion is that if God is for us, who can be against us? If God is for us, who can be against us? And you may wonder, I mean, God is for us, really? Then, then why are there storms? Why didn't he take them all away? If God's for us, then he certainly has a funny way of showing it, doesn't he? If you want to know um, that God is for you, if you want to know how to know God is for you, I mean, what we're going to look at next, this is the crux of the message of Christianity. This is the thing to lean yourself. It all kind of hinges on this whole concept. And here's how you know, here's how you can have confidence that he who did not spare, he could have, but he didn't. He, he who did not spare his own son, his own son, whom he loved, he who did not spare his own son, but gave him up for us all. That's for me, for you, for all people. How will he not also along with him graciously give us all things? That he didn't withhold the most precious thing, which was his son. So why would we think that God is withholding good from us? Did you know that's how the fall came about in the first place? The temptation in the Garden of Eden? That Adam and Eve believed that God was withholding good from them? I mean, think about it. He literally dropped them into an amazing paradise. And they looked at that and said, God's withholding something 
from me. And they were tempted to question God's goodness, just as we're tempted to question God's goodness. But here's Paul's point. Anytime you're tempted to question God's goodness, don't question it. Don't question God's goodness without fully considering his demonstration of love. That when you're wondering about storms, when you're frustrated, when you're discouraged, Paul says, I want you to look to the cross. I want you to look to the cross at this demonstration of love with Jesus' arms spread so wide. This demonstration of love that was so great as he took the sins of the world on his shoulders. And he said, I want you to cling to that. And we don't cling to that because the Bible tells us we need to cling to it. We don't cling to it because the Bible says so. We cling to it because there's this guy, Paul, who gave up his life spreading the message that Jesus died so that you and I could have life. And he wrote this for us and it's preserved for us for 2,000 years. Cling to it because there's James, the half-brother of Jesus, who at one point in time thought his brother was crazy and then later on decided to trust him with his life because he saw him come back to life and he also died a martyr after he led the church in Jerusalem. Cling to it because of guys like Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John who went to extraordinary lengths to preserve the life of Jesus so that 2,000 years later we could know about it. That's why we cling to it because of the hundreds of eyewitnesses recorded in the New Testament, many of whom their names are attached to it, many of whom gave up their lives. (laughs) Paul said, that's how you can be confident. That's how you can be confident. He went on, he said, for I am convinced I am convinced that neither death nor life, neither angels nor demons, neither the present nor the future, nor any powers, neither height nor depth, nor anything else in all creation, no storm, no anything else that could come our way, anything you can think up, any crisis, any brokenness, none of those things will be able to separate us from the, what's this word? From the love, from the love of God that is in Christ Jesus, our Lord. That Jesus, when he came onto this earth, was a walking, talking, living, dying, resurrected example of God's amazing love for us. And so Paul's words, as we look at the brokenness of this world, as we look at creation that is subject to frustration, he says, anchor yourself, anchor yourself. To God's love for you. Love that was demonstrated by an amazingly selfless act. The most selfless act in the history of the world. He says, consider what he, Jesus, did. And don't let any storm get in the way of you clinging to that love. Did you know what our hope is in? It's in God's love that sealed our future hope, that sealed our eternity, and that gives us a point of reference in which to live our lives. So what do we do while we're here on earth in the meantime? What do we do in the meantime? Well, as long as we're here on earth, we just know that there are going to be storms. It's sad, but it's true. And not every ending will be a happy ending. That doesn't mean there will be no happy endings, but there's still death, there's still dying. We don't lock ourselves up in despair. It's not all doom and gloom. But we just recognize that pain is a reflection of a broken world. That as C.S. Lewis said, that there is, there is a recognition in us that we were created for something different. And so our hope isn't in our happy endings. Our hope isn't in, you know, a a solution to this virus. Our hope isn't in getting a new job or a new car or having a baby or, you know, getting to retirement. Our hope isn't having a a date or, you know, getting a degree. Our hope is in something different. Our hope is in God's love. Now, in the meantime, we live life on earth with open hands because we know this is all temporary. We enjoy what we have. We strive to love God and we love others and we live each day to the full because quite honestly, each day could be our last. As soon as you head back to work, it could be that you're hit by a car. I mean, you could contract a virus. You could be diagnosed with something. We don't know. We're not guaranteed of any moment other than the moment we are in right now. 
So do we plan? Yes. Do we save? Yes. Do we live our lives? Yes. And in doing so, we trust God, but we don't place our hope here on earth because the things on earth won't last. Do we date? Do we get married? Yes. Yes. Do we have relationships? Do we, get, do we have children? Yes. Do we strive for a career? Yes. Do we buy a house? Yes. Those are all fine. But the point is that we don't cling to things here because they don't last. They're subject to frustration and decay. To God's love is eternal, Paul says. So we cling to that hope. And in the process, we pry open our hands and we loosen our grip from the plans that we've made and the stuff that we hold on to so tightly that quite frankly probably shouldn't have captured our hearts and lives to begin with. And we begin shifting our trust and our confidence and our hope onto God because he is the one who sustains us. And the good news is a storm can never take that away. No storm can take away the love of God as demonstrated through Jesus Christ, our Lord. Storms take everything else, don't they? I mean, they take houses, they take relationships, they take family members, they take our futures, they take our health. I mean, they take everything. Storms, storms are set free to ravage everything. But you know they can't take God's love away from you? That's the one thing they can never take. So I got to ask you today, do you know God's love? Personally, do you know God's love? Have you placed your hope in that? How are you doing in this pandemic? Are you struggling? How are your relationships? Are you frustrated? Are you fearful? Are you uncertain of what tomorrow is going to bring? And are you overwhelmed by that uncertainty? If so, perhaps today is the day to shift your hope into the one who said, come to me, all of you who are weary and burdened, and I will give you rest. Jesus invited us to come. Come to me, he said. Come. So here's the bottom line for today. Hope is the connection between us and our anchor. It doesn't matter how good your anchor is if there's no connection to it. And hope is the thing that helps us to hold on, right? I mean, when the storm is coming, the anchor is deep into the rock and your boat's being pulled by the wind. And the anchor is the one thing that gets tensed and pulled. And it's the one thing that holds you down. And the truth is what or whom you're hoping in is what determines your ability to weather this storm. The invitation that's given to us is that we place our hope in God's unfailing love. Psalm 33, verse 22. May your unfailing love be with us, Lord, even as we put our hope in you. If you don't know that hope, then I want to give you an opportunity here in just a minute to receive it. It's as simple as, as shifting your trust and your hope into the person of Jesus and the love that he displayed for us on the cross. I'm going to invite you to pray along with me. A prayer doesn't make you, you know, have that hope. It's just a declaration of hope. And if you've never prayed a prayer like this before, maybe today is the day. I want to invite you to find hope for the first time. Hope in something that will hold you down and that will give you anchor faith. And so if that's you, I just invite you to close your eyes and bow your head with me and, and just pray in the silent, in the silence of your heart as you um, think about the hope that God offers to us through the love of Jesus. So just pray along with me these words. I'll give you some words to speak. Again, it's not a prayer that allows you to have that hope. The prayer is simply a declaration of that hope. And then I'm going to pray for us to close our time. So if you're ready to receive that hope, would you pray with me? Say, Dear Heavenly Father, I have been hoping in things that do not last. I have been hoping in things on this earth 
that are not bringing me peace in the midst of this storm. And so God, today I am declaring my hope in the love of Jesus that was displayed for me when he died on the cross for me. And God, would you help me to receive life and to hold on to that future hope that we have in him. And now let me pray for all of us as we close this time together. Gracious Heavenly Father, I thank you, thank you, thank you that you have given us something to hope in that is so much bigger than anything on this broken earth. Thank you for the hope that we have in the love displayed for, through Jesus. And I pray that those who do not know hope, that they would come to know it today. Thank you that we can lean our lives into that. We are grateful. And we pray these things in the matchless name of Jesus Christ, our risen Lord. Amen. Well, thank you so much for joining us today. I hope that you enjoyed today's message. In fact, I hope that you've enjoyed this series as a whole. If you missed any of the messages from our Anchored in the Storm series, you can always catch them on our YouTube channel or you can go to our website to find them. And uh, today, if, if you took that amazing first step of faith, if you prayed that prayer along with Seth and put your hope in Jesus, we would love the chance to be able to connect with you, to be able to pray for you. So if you joined us on the live.icommunitychurch.com, you can chat with us on the side. Uh, otherwise, if you're watching on YouTube, you can just text connect to this number here, 812 575 4229. Again, we would love to be able to connect with you, to be able to pray and celebrate with you on that amazing first step. And uh, if, if you've enjoyed this series, I can tell you you're absolutely going to love next week. We start a new four-week series next week. It's called Come and See, which is a little bit ironic because you're not coming here to see it. Um, but that's exactly why we're going to be talking about it. So we look forward to joining you next week. And uh, please invite your friends to watch as well. Have a wonderful, wonderful day. Thank you.